Greetings. I'm Dr. Stan Steindl, and I'm no neuroscientist, but let's go to Vegas. The Vegas nerve, that is. Earlier this week, I had the great pleasure and honour of being the talking head on a project led by Dr. Jamin Day from the University of Newcastle and Dr. James Kirby from the University of Queensland. This project involves developing an online compassion-focused program aimed at supporting people who are recovering from a workplace injury. It's a very cool project. Anyway, we got up to the bit about the physiological aspects of cultivating the compassionate mind, which made reference to the vagus nerve. Jamin, James and I bounced around a few ideas about how to present this information and also how much to present so that it made sense and was helpful. It's an important part of compassionate wisdom and also an important part of cultivating strength and groundedness. But it's also how long is a piece of string? The neuroscience of it all can be very detailed and rather complex. So anyway, here's a rather rudimentary explanation, trying to offer something that's meaningful and useful, and at the same time, brief and concise. Let me know what you think. As part of the compassionate mind, we deepen our compassionate wisdom and understanding of the brain and how it works. Also, we learn ways to cultivate strength and groundedness, and we commit to regular practice. Neuroscience can offer us insights on all three aspects. Not sure whether you can tell what this is? It's the human brain, not to scale. Our brain and the nerves that it sends out through the spinal cord represent the central nervous system. Now, this is a super intricate collection of structures and functions. But let's break it down to two key elements that are helpful to consider as we cultivate the compassionate mind. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is like the accelerator in a car. It helps to upregulate the physical body, speeds us up if you like. The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, is like the brake, helping to downregulate our body, slowing us down and grounding us. And a lot of the time, the two are working together. A little bit of accelerator, a little bit of brake, sticking to the speed limit, the in-breath activates the sympathetic nervous system and the out-breath activates the parasympathetic nervous system. In, out. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. Keeping us at the speed limit. When we face a challenge or stressor or threat, the sympathetic nervous system activates and the parasympathetic nervous system deactivates. The well-known fight, flight, freeze, appease response. However, often the parasympathetic nervous system can hold or recover more quickly. We are able to stay with or return to a sense of feeling strong or grounded. We feel able to cope in a stressful or threatening situation. So what's behind all this? Well, over recent years, psychologists and others have become fascinated with the vagus nerve. This is the 10th cranial nerve that comes from the brain, travels through the spinal cord and spreads out across the body, connecting with the heart and lungs and digestive systems and other organs and bodily functions. And it's the vagus nerve that's associated with parasympathetic nervous system and holding parasympathetic activation. It's largely responsible for regulating various parts of the body when at rest. But its effectiveness depends on what they call vagal tone. 
Vagal tone relates to vagus nerve activity, with stronger vagal tone helping us to downregulate more quickly after experiencing stress. Lower vagal tone can mean that we are more susceptible to challenges, stressors and threats, so that the parasympathetic nervous system simply drops out and the sympathetic nervous system takes over. This can mean that we experience very powerful and painful physiological sensations and emotions from which it can be much more difficult to recover. Unfortunately, life experiences can influence vagal tone. Adverse childhood experiences can lead to lower vagal tone, which means greater difficulty in coping with or recovering from stressful experiences as time goes on. But just like we might tone up our muscles, we can improve our vagal tone through exercise and practice. In fact, this is quite an optimistic area of neuroscience and psychological science. And the best way to hack the vagus nerve and increase vagal tone? Always bring it back to the body. Body posture, facial expression, voice tone, and especially soothing rhythm breathing. These body-based practices from compassionate mind training help to strengthen vagal tone and therefore our ability to hold parasympathetic nervous system activation and maintain a sense of strength and groundedness when we need it most. In a way, Regular body-based practice means that our vagus nerve is ready to go, ready to support us physiologically. Kind of like, hello stress, here's something I prepared earlier. So there's a snapshot of the vagus nerve. Thank you, Jamin and James, for our conversation earlier this week. And I'm really interested to hear what you think about this brief description of the vagus nerve. I think it's really useful to have accessible ways to learn about these complex concepts from neuroscience. They help us understand our own brains and offer a rationale for practicing body-based strategies for staying strong and grounded in the face of threat. And if you like, you could return to my earlier video, Always Bring It Back to the Body, Part 2, for a body-based practice that you can try. Thanks for watching and be sure to follow my YouTube channel if you would like to see more of these videos. And I wish you all the very best on your compassionate journey.